Hey, Mort, I know you're always looking for things to listen to while you're digging graves, and I have just the podcast for you. Oh, really? Pessimist Archive, a history show about why people resist new things, and you know you do. But I like old things, especially if they're dead. Each episode brings a moment that something new was introduced, something that today we think of as commonplace, you know, an umbrella, a bicycle, cars, even coffee. And the show tries to understand why it freaked everyone out. Some of the funny historical tidbits they cover on the podcast include doctors warning that novel reading would make women infertile. When the bicycle was new, doctors warned that riders would get bicycle face, a condition caused by sustained wind blowing in the face, thus permanently stretching the skin. <laughs> Some of the things you'll probably learn from listening to Pessimist Archive is that history repeats itself, that we shouldn't be afraid of new technology, and we might understand why people tend to resist innovation. Ultimately, Pessimist Archive is a show about progress and the long road to getting there. Check it out wherever you listen to podcasts. History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spectacular people. Welcome to this 307th episode of the History Ghost Bump podcast, Ghost Tours for the Theater of the Mind. I am your host, Diane. This episode is featuring something I've been planning to do for quite some time and just haven't been able to get around to doing it. But I've been binge listening to a podcast called History of Witchcraft, and it inspired me to get it together and do this episode, which is featuring a history of witch hunts. Now, obviously, this is going to be a brief overview because it would be an entire podcast series or even podcast, as History of Witchcraft proves, to talk about everything that happened during this. Then, of course, we're going to talk about some of the ghosts that are associated with witch hunts. And speaking of witchcraft, I could use some right now because I'm recording this ahead of when I usually do because we're getting ready for our trip to Iowa and right before that, Hurricane Dorian is bearing down on us. And we're not sure if it's going to hit us here in Central Florida or not. We're expecting the worst and hoping for the best. And I could use a little witchcraft to steer him back out to sea. The portrait of Dorian Gray is one of my favorite stories, but right now I'm really hating Dorian. All right, before we get into all that, let's welcome into the Spooktacular crew, Joy, Misty, Therese, Jesse, Eduardo, Doriano, Joseph, Lisa, Jesse, Anita, Jamie, Donna, Jenny with a Y, Joe with just a J-O, Elia, Sherry, Dominic, Jasmine with a Z, Benito, Mike, and Trish. Welcome, everybody. And now, this moment, Naughty. The moment Naughty was suggested by Laura Ann Williams. The unknown woman of the Seine. That's the only name an unidentified woman found drowned in the Seine is known by, and yet, she's famous. She died in the late 1800s at a time when the best way to identify an unidentified person was to put them on display. That's what they did in Paris at the mortuary where her body was taken. For days, no one claimed to know the girl. She had died with a sweet smile on her face that still remained after death. It is said that the pathologist who worked with her body was so touched by the gentle smiling face that he decided to make a death mask from it using plaster. A weird thing happened after that. The death mask actually became a piece of art that was copied over and over, and people would put it up in their homes. At least, that is according to the story. There are those that believe the truth is that a manufacturer in Germany had used his young tween daughter to make the mask, and that's why the face has the smile. Whatever the case, the story becomes even more odd as we continue. Critic A. Alvarez wrote a book about suicide called The Savage God, 
and in it he writes, I am told that a whole generation of German girls modeled their looks on her. Fast forward to 1955 when toy maker Asmund Lerdahl created the CPR doll. He wanted this life-saving doll to have a real look, and he remembered that his grandparents had this death mask on their wall when he was young. He modeled Recessi Anne, or what I call Annie, after the unknown woman of the sin. It is now said to be the most kissed face in the world, and that certainly is odd. You're not afraid of a little ghost, are you? And now, this month in history. In the month of September, on the 23rd in 1962, the Jetsons cartoon aired for the first time. While many of us probably remember watching it on Saturday mornings or weekday mornings before school, it actually started in prime time, airing on Sunday nights on ABC TV. And a fun fact is that this was the first program broadcast in color on ABC TV. The original run lasted until March 17, 1963 and was produced by Hanna-Barbera. New episodes were produced in the 1980s from 1985 to 1987. The cartoon featured a family living in the space age with flying cars and a robot maid. There was George Jetson, his boy Elroy, daughter Judy, Jane, his wife, and then of course their dog Astro and the robot maid named Rosie. There were 75 episodes in total and there was a movie in 1990 and another in 2017 called The Jetsons in WWE Robo WrestleMania. The Jetsons is one of the few animated series to have aired on all three big networks at that time, CBS, NBC, and ABC. The term witch hunt has been used in our modern era as a descriptor when it comes to persecution and investigations, particularly in the world of politics. But the historical witch hunts that I want to explore in this episode were far more different and, of course, dangerous. The persecution of people who believe or worship outside the lines of societal quote-unquote norms has been with us since recorded time. Rejecting and abusing people because they are quote-unquote different is unfortunately a familiar part of all societies and communities. There was a time when witch hunts reached a fever pitch in Europe and America and people were left dead in their wake. Over three centuries, an estimated 100,000 people were executed, with 75% of them being women. Join me on this episode as I present a brief history of witch hunts. There is a more obscure piece of Nazi history connected to historic witch hunts. The same week that I began research on this episode, I received an email from the magazine History Today because I'm on their email list. And in our familiar synchronistic style around here, the cover story was about Heinrich Himmler and his Hexenkartathek, or Special Assignment H Unit, which was a group of SS researchers assigned the duty of finding all the information they could about historic witch trials in Europe. Now, you're probably scratching your head just like I was as to why the SS would be wasting their time with this kind of research. Now, I know they were really into the occult and that kind of thing, but that's not really what they were looking into here. They weren't trying to figure out spells that they could cast in order to win the war or something. That's what initially came to my mind, but it was actually for a different reason. Apparently, they wanted to find proof that the church was on an anti-German crusade. And let me just say that the research they did was similar to just reading off a of Wikipedia. They even included fictional accounts from plays and books, never bothering to differentiate what was real and what was fiction. But one thing that William Badger and Diane Perkis point out in their article, Preter Nature, Critical and Historical Studies on the Preternatural, published by the Penn State University Press, is that, quote, This also constitutes the first critical biographical analysis in any language of the sources for the English trial cards in the catalog, end quote. I share this because I find it interesting that Nazis would have had such an interest in witch trials. Just amused me a little bit. 
And of course, I find this interesting because this came to my attention at the same time that I was doing this research. So as I like to say, I don't believe in coincidences. What are the chances I'm researching witch hunts? And then this comes across my computer and I'm like, wow, I had no idea that the SS was researching witch hunts at one time too. Let's start first with a very basic question, and that is, what is witchcraft? Now, I've had people who are part of Wicca or practice witchcraft join me on the show. They've shared some of their holidays that they celebrate and some of the things that they do. So there's a little bit of information out there throughout different podcast episodes here. A dictionary gives a very basic definition, and that's something along the lines of the practice of magic, especially black magic and the use of spells. But to me, the answer is actually very complicated. If you know anything about witchcraft, there is no simple answer. If someone was to ask you, what is witchcraft? It's like, okay, well, along what lines? It really depends on who you ask. And for practitioners of witchcraft, it depends on what they're interested in pursuing. Some belong to a religious group like Wicca, and others are secular and even atheists. Some cast spells and hexes, while others are more into growing herbs and plants. For the most part, for me, now this is me, I would personally describe witchcraft as being a natural spiritual belief. And I think witchcraft can be a catch-all term for voodoo practitioners, shaman, medicine men, and etc. They each have different techniques and beliefs, but at the core, they are very similar. That is probably part of the issue when it comes to these historical witch hunts, because anything outside of the top religion was evil. And of course, back in that time, you had the three major religions. You had Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, all of which do not allow witchcraft or have any good feelings towards that. So anything really falling outside of that to them is going to be considered some kind of form of witchcraft. There were probably people making tinctures and running things through fire and talking to nature and plants and believing in superstitious stuff, and this caused them to be outside of society's general beliefs as ruled by the church and such. And when I talk about the church here, I'm mostly referring to the Catholic Church. Now, I'm sure there were people back in the 1500s and 1600s who actually believed that witches were flying on sticks and turning people into newts. But for the most part, what we had happening during these witch hunts were people being falsely accused. And this brings me to the next question here, and that is, what sparked the larger witch hunts? The causes are numerous, but the uptick in Europe most definitely is connected to the Reformation. Angela Michelle Schultz writes in her article, Witchcraft, What Caused the Witch Hunts in Early Modern Europe? Quote, One reformer responsible for the rise and fear of Satan was John Calvin, who stated, For after Satan has possessed us once and stopped our eyes, and God has withdrawn his light from us, so that we are destitute of his Holy Spirit and devoid of all reason, then there follow infinite abuses without end or measure and many sorceries come from this condition. Angela continues, Due to such reformers as Calvin, the early modern European believed the danger that Satan presented to a person was both physical and spiritual. Everyone, even the holiest individual, could be deceived and ensnared by the cunning treachery of Satan. These beliefs brought about a heightened awareness of diabolical acts, causing European societies to be more willing to put accused witches on trial due to fear. Communities wanted to purify their neighborhoods by getting rid of all evil, even if it meant putting their neighbor to death. By doing so, the judicial system was used in order to advocate against any act that did not line up with the word of God. I have to agree with what Angela's written here. I think a lot of it had to do with fear. And can you imagine the kind of fear and hysteria that makes it okay for your neighbor to be put to death? I mean, this just is mind-boggling to us today. Europe was in complete upheaval as the church split and the Catholics lost control. So you can imagine what the church is thinking here. They've got these Protestants now and they're not happy. Add to this environmental issues that caused famine and many people were living in poverty. When bad times hit, it is easy for us all to point fingers in other directions and lay blame elsewhere. This same thinking traveled to America where colonists are going to run into hard times and people who have different spiritual beliefs like Native Americans. There was also religious intolerance. An interesting side note to this time during the 16th century was something that happened in Italy. There were a group of people who referred to themselves as Benin and Dante, and they thought of themselves as protectors of the land. 
It is said that on Ember Days, and these are religious days in the church, which fell four times a year, they would fall into trances and ride off to combat evil in the form of witches. And when I say ride off, I'm talking about like jumping on rabbits and different kinds of animals or things, winged creatures to fly in the sky. Clearly, these people would seem to be on the side of the church because, I mean, they're doing it on Ember Days. They believe that they're Christians, but rather the leaders of the church heard these stories of riding off on all types of animals and even flying through the sky after holding secret meetings and falling into trances, and the church concluded that the Ben and Dante were in fact witches. Any other religious belief was of Satan, and the fervor to stamp it out was beginning. And we can't ignore that with 75% of the victims being female, misogyny has to have had some part in this. So how did they test to find out if someone was a witch? I mean, you can't just go around blaming people. There has to be a way to test this. It can't just be he said, she said. We've discussed this in various episodes as well. But as a reminder, we'll run through the main tests. And there may be a couple here that I haven't talked about in the past, too. One method we know is pressing, but it really was just smothering with stones. Usually an accused person would be placed between two slabs and crushed in some way. Giles Corey of Salem fame is an example of this type of test. Another method was dunking, and usually a wooden chair was used for this and attached to a pulley system so that an accused could be tied down to the chair and dunked into water for long periods of time to get a confession. There was the mark test in which an accused would be stripped naked and searched for the mark of the beast, which could be as simple as a birthmark. So any of you who have a birthmark, the devil kissed you. I have one, so I guess I'm of Satan too. Searching someone's house also was a test to see if they owned any witchy artifacts. Sometimes accused were asked to recite a prayer, like the Lord's Prayer, and if they were unable, they were found guilty. There was the nasty cake test, which consisted of mixing a victim's urine with rye meal and baking it. The cake would be fed to a witch's familiar, say like a dog, and if the witch screamed in pain, he or she was guilty. There was the prick test in which needles were used to stab at the skin of the accused to see if it caused pain or bleeding because it was thought a witch was insensitive to this type of thing. And I just want to point out that there were some witch finders out there that altered that test a little bit. They would make one side of the needle sharp and the other side not sharp and poke them with the not sharp side and say, see, look at the needle. It's got a sharp end, but it's not making them bleed. A victim was also allowed to scratch at the supposed witch to see if that would help relieve their symptoms. There was the touch test, and this was based on the belief that a victim would fall under a spell if touched by the person who had bewitched them. The most popular test was a trial by water in which the accused would be bound with ropes and thrown into a body of water to see if they would float. If they did float, they were thought to be a witch. If they sank and drowned, well, they were not a witch, but they were also dead. And I just want to note that I learned from the History of Witchcraft podcast that dunked people were attached to a rope. So very few actually drowned, correcting a misconception that I'd always had. I've joked on here many times, you're dead either way. A lot of the time, apparently, people did not drown. All of these tests usually led to death eventually because most people would be found guilty and executed. In Europe, burning at the stake was popular, while in America, hanging was mainly what was done. As far as we know, no one was burned at the stake in recorded American history. Doesn't mean it wasn't done, it just wasn't recorded. Now that we've fleshed out the basics, let's take a cursory walk through history. As I've said, this is going to be a brief history rather than comprehensive. I do encourage you to check out the podcast History of Witchcraft to get a more thorough covering of the witch hunts. Obviously, people who would be thought of as witches or magicians have been around for all of recorded time. The earliest accounts can be found in the Talmud and Hebrew scriptures, what we call today the Old Testament. Verses about witchcraft are negative and call for the execution of anyone practicing witchcraft. The most famous witch in the Bible is the witch of Endor. This is a narrative found in 1 Samuel 28. 
King Saul is the ruler of the Israelites, and he's issued a lot of edicts and rules. And one of these was that anyone who consulted a witch should be put to death, which also in turn means if you practice witchcraft, you would be put to death. Then he turns around and consults a witch. He needs some advice from his old friend, the prophet Samuel. There's just one problem. Samuel's dead. So Saul disguises himself and runs off to find the witch of Endor, whom he asked to conjure up the spirit of Samuel. She does so, and Samuel's pissed and reveals Saul to the witch, who freaks out because she knows the king has said witches would be put to death. The story ends with Samuel letting Saul know that he and his sons are dead tomorrow, and they are. We don't hear anything further about the witch of Endor, but we can assume if she's found out, she will be put to death. This passage is also one that I talked about in the bonus cast that I did about ghosts in the Bible, proving that there is such a thing as spirits in the afterlife, according to the scriptures, and that you can be brought back over the veil to talk to people. During medieval times, many texts were written about practices and beliefs outside of the church, like fortune telling and curses. The Black Death is crossing Europe, and of course, the church blames witchcraft for the disease. One thing the Roman Catholic Church did differentiate at this time was the types of magic. They believed there were two, which is similar to what we hear today. There was natural magic and then demonic magic. Natural magic was thought of as just worshiping the power of nature that came from God. Today, that might be thought of as being along the lines of white magic. Demonic magic would be like black magic. I find it interesting that this is about the same time as Satan starts popping up in the hoofed feet, red body, horns, and tail. The emphasis on the devil caused there to be an emphasis on witchcraft. As we move to the end of the medieval time, people who were witches moved from being thought of as deceived by the cunning of Satan to all-out devil worshippers, and that by denouncing God, they had achieved supernatural powers. There was no formal witch trials as we understand them during this time, but there was the Inquisition. The Inquisition started in France in the 12th century and would continue through to the 15th century. This was a group of Catholic judges or inquisitors tasked with rooting out heresy and obviously claims of witchcraft were investigated. Pope Alexander IV would officially declare in 1258 that communicating with demons and working magic like a sorcerer were heresy. Thomas Aquinas wrote about sorcery in his Summa Theologica, and in it he wrote of demons assuming the shapes of humans. So that neighbor doing witchcraft over there might not actually be your neighbor, but rather a demon. The next big act of persecution came against the Knights Templar in 1307 on Friday, October 13th, and one of the main charges was practicing witchcraft. So the Knights Templar basically went from leading the Crusades for the Catholic Church to being executed by the Church for committing witchcraft. And for any of you who've studied that, especially if you wanted to find out the origins of why Friday the 13th is thought to be a bad day, it's because of this. And the whole reason this happened is because the Knights Templar was getting too much money and too much power and the church didn't like it. And now a word from our sponsors. Hey, Kelly, dinner's ready. Oh, this looks great. Can you believe Mort made this? Stop it. He did not. Yep, with the help of HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit that provides easy seasonal recipes with pre-measured ingredients delivered right to the door. It was simple and it only took me 30 minutes. Too bad you don't dig grapes that fast. This roasted pork tenderloin with lemony potatoes and zucchini looks delicious. And it's not surprising since HelloFresh has more five-star recipes than any other meal kit. It is delicious. Hello Fresh is really flexible too, like a pre rigor mortis body. <laughs> right, Mort. You can add extra meals to your weekly order, and there's even add ons like garlic bread and cookie dough. And you could change delivery days or skip a week. And with Calorie Smart, Vegetarian, and Fun Menu series, there's something for everyone. For $80 off your first month of Hello Fresh, go to HelloFresh.com forward slash bump 80. And enter code BUMP80. That's B-U-M-P-80. Man, that's like receiving eight meals free. For $80 off your first month of HelloFresh, go to HelloFresh.com forward slash B-U-M-P-80 and enter B-U-M-P-80. Here's another podcast I think you guys would enjoy. 
Hi, I'm Rebecca Lieb. And I'm Jason Horton. And we're the hosts of Ghost Town, a comedy podcast about all places abandoned, tragic, mysterious, haunted, and true crimey. That's not a word. Eh. We cover all kinds of locations like... The Los Feliz Murder House. An L.A. murder frozen in time. Action Park. The world's most dangerous amusement park. JonBenet Ramsey's house, Woodstock 99, the Cecil Hotel, and the Black House. Ooh, Satan. Mm. So pause the podcast you're currently listening to immediately and go subscribe to Ghost Town. You can find us at Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. The official witch hunts would begin in the early 1500s. It would be during this time as well that various witchcraft acts in England and Russia would move the trials towards the government and away from the church. In 1581, the largest witchcraft hunts and trials in Europe took place in Trier, Germany. These trials lasted through 1593. This all began when Johann von Schonenberg was appointed Archbishop of the Independent Diocese of Trier, and he made a commitment to rid the area of Jews, Protestants, and witches. People accused of witchcraft would suffer greatly, leaving over 350 people burned at the stake. A witness at the time reported, quote, The whole country rose to exterminate the witches. This movement was promoted by many in office who hoped for wealth from the persecution. And so, from court to court throughout the towns and villages of all the dioceses, scurried special accusers, inquisitors, notaries, jurors, judges, constables, dragging to trial and torture human beings of both sexes and burning them in great numbers. This wouldn't be it for Germany, though. Several more periods of trial erupted, taking on the names of the areas in which they occurred. There would be the Fulda Witch Trials from 1603 to 1606, the Basque Witch Trials from 1609 to 1611, the Bamberg Witch Trials from 1626 to 1631, and the Würzburg Witch Trials from 1626 to 1631. In 1597, King James I wrote Demonology, and in it he claimed that demon possession and witchcraft were, quote, most common in such wild parts of the world because the devil finds greatest ignorance and barbary there, end quote. One can imagine that the New World would be one such location. The first colony was founded in America in 1607 at Jamestown, Virginia. This time is at the heart of the witch craze in Europe, and now these people are coming over to America and bringing those beliefs with them, along with this idea that the devil likes these wild and untamed places. Also, before these colonists left, King James I had issued the Witchcraft Act of 1604, making it a felony to practice witchcraft and moving trials to common courts rather than the church. There would be no burning at the stake anymore, only hanging. And for minor offenses, it would take a second offense to bring about the death penalty. So I guess you could say they were easing back a little? So the colonists step off the boat and meet the Native Americans already here. And listeners, I'm sure you already know what they're thinking when it comes to these wild men who seem to worship nature. And John Smith himself wrote that the chief god they worshipped was the devil. Shortly after the colonists started setting up homes in the New World, the Old World was hosting the Pendle Witch Trials in Lancashire, England in 1612. I've had several requests to cover the Pendle Witches, so here we go. In these infamous trials, 12 people were accused, with six of them belonging to rival families in the town of Lancashire. These families were the Demdike family and the Chaddix family. There were no fathers, as both had died, and the families lived in utter poverty. So you've got these two widows who are very old at the top of these families. Apparently, it was no secret in the town that the head of the Demdike family, who was named Elizabeth, was a witch, and had been so for over 50 years. This had not been a problem until the uptick in anti-witchcraft fervor. You know, everybody wants a witch around for an old folk remedy until they don't want a witch around. Enter a peddler named John Law. He's on the side of the road begging when Allison Device comes along and asks him for some pins, and that's P-I-N-S, which he refused to give her, so she cursed him. People believe that this curse was real after John Law has a stroke. Law reports this to a judge, and Allison confesses that she did ask the devil to curse him. And then here we go, because the judge wants more names. Allison fingers her grandmother, who is Elizabeth Demdike, and members of the Chaddix family, because remember, they're having issues with that family, so hey, why not bring them into this? The feud between the families is coming to a head now. Other members of the town blame the head of the Chaddix family for making people ill. With torture, the heads of both families confessed, and 12 people stood accused. Janet Device, who was nine years old at the time, was a main witness. It's hard for us to understand how a nine-year-old's testimony could lead to executions, but at the time, it was allowed. 
This little girl also testified against her siblings and mother. Elizabeth Demdike would die in jail, 10 of the accused would be hanged, and one would be found not guilty. The year 1626 was key both in Europe and America. In 1626, the Virginia General Court put a midwife named Joan Wright on trial, and she would come to be known as Surrey's Witch. Several of her neighbors had come forward accusing her of all kinds of witchery, including people claiming she had bewitched them, cursed a man's tobacco fields causing them to flood, cursed their butter churns so they would not work properly, and the worst accusation was that she caused a baby to die. Joan's husband was asked to testify on her behalf, and he said he never knew of his wife doing anything that could be considered witchcraft, and with that, the matter seemed to disappear. So she couldn't speak for herself, her husband had to speak for her, and since he spoke up for her, well then she's okay. And as you can see, there wasn't a lot of pressure or torture put on this woman. Virginia was much more lenient than Massachusetts when it came to accusations of witchcraft. The punishments were less, and they didn't really push to get people to confess. Over in Europe, two more major witch trials started in this year, 1626, and I mentioned them earlier. This would be the Bamberg Witch Trials and the Würzburg Witch Trials. The thing that was the most disturbing about the Würzburg Trials was that a great number of children were burned at the stake. Children burned at the stake. Nobody was safe from the sweep, with 400 being caught up, including clergy. The term hysteria barely describes how horrible this was, and I think the words of the Chancellor of the Prince Bishop of Würzburg says it best. He wrote to a friend in 1629, quote, There are law students to be arrested. The Prince Bishop has over 40 students who are soon to be pastors. Among them, 13 or 14 are said to be witches. A few days ago, a dean was arrested. Two others who were summoned have fled. The notary of our church consistory, a very learned man, was yesterday arrested and put to the torture. In a word, a third part of the city is surely involved. The richest, most attractive, most prominent of the clergy are already executed. A week ago, a maiden of 19 was executed, of whom it is everywhere said that she was the fairest in the whole city and was held by everybody a girl of singular modesty and purity. She will be followed by seven or eight others of the best and most attractive persons, and thus many are put to death for renouncing God and being at the witch dances, against whom nobody has ever else spoken a word. To conclude this wretched matter, there are children of three and four years to the number of 300 who are said to have had intercourse with the devil. I have seen put to death children of seven, promising students of 10, 12, 14, and 15 of the nobles, but I cannot and must not write more of this misery. Though there are many wonderful and terrible things happening, it is beyond doubt that at a place called the Frau Renberg, the devil in person with 8,000 of his followers held an assembly and celebrated mass before them all, administering to his audience, that is, the witches, turnip rinds and parings in place of the Holy Eucharist. There took place not only foul but most horrible and hideous blasphemies, whereof I shudder to write. It is also true that all vowed not to be enrolled in the Book of Life, but all agreed to be inscribed by a notary who is well known to me and my colleagues. We hope, too, that the book in which they are enrolled will yet be found, and there is no little search being made for it." End quote. So first, I wanted to describe to you what these people were doing to each other. The hysteria had reached such a height that they believed toddlers were having sex with demons and putting them to death. I mean, this is insane. Secondly, I wanted you to hear this guy. He not only is talking about these horrors, and I'm hoping that he's feeling really bad about them, but then when you get to the end there, he actually believed that this kind of witchcraft and demon worship was really going on. I mean, he believes the devil actually held this mass before 8,000 people in a nearby town. Really, Satan came to this town near you and had this Eucharist for all these people? The story of Father Ubain Grandier is bizarre and scandalous. He'd gone to a Jesuit college to become a priest. His uncle had some pull with the Jesuits, and this got Grandier into a high position early, which caused some resentment. Now, priests are supposed to be celibate, but he missed the memo somewhere because it was rumored he had sexual relationships with many women, and one even gave birth to his son. Usually you don't hear of a priest being described as promiscuous, but this guy definitely was, and apparently he was really good looking, so it was easy for him to do this. In 1632, a group of Ursuline nuns, this is the same order as those on the Ursuline convent in New Orleans that I've mentioned before that was home to the casket girls, They needed a spiritual leader. The head nun was known as Sister Jean. Rumors are that she had a thing for the father, and so she asked him to become the leader. And she was hoping they might get a little bit something going on, too. 
When he said no, well, that was that. The nuns accused him of being a sorcerer. And not only did he practice witchcraft, but he sent a demon named Asmodai to molest the nuns. I mean, the sister Jean is saying she's having these dreams at night where she's supposedly having sex with Father Grandeur. And then all of a sudden this demon is coming along. And so it's like the demon is having sex with her. And personally, I think it's these nuns aren't dealing very well with celibate life. And because she likes him, she's either making up these dreams or she's really having dreams about him. It wasn't because some demon had come to her. Grandeur was tortured, but he wouldn't confess. And when I say tortured, I mean, this guy was tortured. I hadn't heard anything like this before. The torture was extreme. The Spanish boot was used on him. And if you don't know what that was, this was an iron vice filled with spikes that were heated to red hot and closed on the calf until the bones broke. They usually would only do it to one leg, but they really hated this guy, so they broke both of his legs in this way. Then he was basically waterboarded, which at that time was called the extraordinary question. Water was poured down the throat, what I'm imagining is a beer bong, and they've crammed it down his throat. And then they just fill you up with water until you get this distension in your stomach. We all know nowadays that you can get water intoxication, which can lead to death. And so they would almost take them to that point and then they would force them to throw it all back up and then they might repeat that again and just take them almost to the point of death. Some people would actually die from the extraordinary question. Grandeur, unfortunately, didn't because it's going to get even worse for him. He was found guilty without a confession because he never would confess and sentenced to death. That death sentence was carried out in 1634 and he was burned alive at the stake. He wasn't supposed to be burned alive. They were supposed to hang him and then burn him at the stake. But they decided to change that up at the last minute, and he was burned alive. Now, what I just told you here about Father Grandier, this was a very brief telling of what was a very elaborate trial full of exorcisms and supposed demon possession. All these nuns supposedly were demon-possessed. And the interesting thing is that these possessions continued even after the father was executed, at least according to their records. In 1654, a woman named Catherine Grady was making a trip from England to the New World. Virginia was her destination. Along the way, a huge storm overtook the ship. Rather than just assume that this was nature, the crew blamed Catherine for some reason, and they said she was doing it with witchcraft. A quick trial was held aboard the ship, and while there's no record of what happened during that trial, the result was her being hanged before they reached Virginia. Men were not immune to accusations either. Virginia would put William Harding on trial for witchcraft and sentenced to 13 lashes. Virginia didn't experience the hysteria that Massachusetts did. There was extreme hesitation in the courts to accuse someone of witchcraft because of the severity of the crime. According to historical reports, no women in Virginia died as a result of these trials, and only one woman was found guilty. She was known as the Witch of Pungo, Grace Sherwood of Princess Anne County. We covered her story in Haunting in episode 279 about fairy plantation, so I won't rehash all of that here. In 1706, she was convicted. A woman named Mary was accused of using witchcraft to help find lost things and was given 39 lashes as punishment. The witch trials would come to an end in Virginia in 1730. King Louis XIV of France finally put an end to witch hunts there in 1682. Witch hunts and trials would move towards ending in England that same year as well. The last documented witch hangings happened that year, resulting in the deaths of Susanna Edward and Mary Trembles. The year 1717 saw the last witch trial, and witch hunts formally ended with the English Witchcraft Act in 1736. But witch hunts in America were ramping up, and the Salem witch trial started in 1692. We covered the details of this on episode 61, so I'm not going to rehash all of that here either. There were not a lot of witch hunts in Pennsylvania, but there was a trial in 1683. I'll let Dina Marie of the Twisted Philly podcast tell you all about it. When some people think of witchcraft in America, thoughts of the crucible enter their minds. The fictionalized version of the witch trials in Salem, Massachusetts from 1692. They may have heard the story of Giles Corey, the last resident murdered as a result of that inquisition. Or Rebecca Nurse, who at 71 years old was hanged for witchcraft even though she was likely the most pious woman in her village. No doubt Diane will share their stories and so many more about the victims of the Salem witchcraft trials and witchcraft in other parts of the country. The stories from Salem are numerous, but they weren't the first witch trials in America. 
What's believed to be the very first reported case of an accused witch happened in Pennsylvania almost a decade before the Salem witch trials back in 1683. That's when Swedish immigrant Margaret Matson was accused of witchcraft. It wasn't the first time she'd been called a witch. Rumors circulated about Margaret since the early 1660s. Matson lived in an area of Pennsylvania called New Sweden. But today we know that as the town of Eddystone. It's a suburb of Philadelphia in an area called Delaware County. Harsh accusations were made against Margaret Matson after her husband and son decided to sell their land in Pennsylvania. That land included crops, which would be ready to harvest and sell in the summer of 1683, which meant anyone who got their hands on the Matson farm would soon recoup some of the money they spent on the property. Perhaps if Nels Matson's wife Margaret was an accused witch, Nels would lose his property or be forced to sell it more cheaply. That would have created even more interest in his land. A grand jury was convened to try Margaret Matson for witchcraft on February 27, 1683. The grand jury was made up of eight prominent men. These were early settlers of Pennsylvania, including the state's founder, William Penn, who was then our governor. Some claim Margaret Matson was actually questioned directly by Penn, but all of the questions put to Margaret by the grand jury had to be asked through an interpreter, as she only spoke Finnish. As you might imagine, there were witnesses present to testify against Margaret. Neighbors accused Margaret Matson of bewitching their livestock. One even said Margaret's son sold his livestock in an effort to prevent his mother from bewitching them, as if a mother would intentionally hurt the livelihood of her own child. Margaret Matson, through her interpreter, vehemently denied these accusations. She called them hearsay, and according to court records, which survived over 330 years, Margaret said she denied these allegations to the depth of her soul. Governor William Penn and the other members of the grand jury found Margaret Matson not guilty of practicing witchcraft, although she may have been guilty of having the reputation of a witch. Even though she was acquitted, her husband Nels Matson was fined 50 pounds for Margaret's court appearance. She was released into her husband's custody and placed on what I like to call the colonist's version of parole, behave yourself for six months. There's a legend that William Penn asked her if she ever flew on a broomstick. And when Margaret's interpreter explained she didn't understand the question, William Penn said, well, there's no law against that anyway. I found another telling of this trial where it was reported Margaret actually did answer that question in the affirmative, meaning she had ridden on a broomstick. At the time of Margaret Matson's trial, Pennsylvania had no laws against witchcraft. In the early 1700s, the state adopted the laws of the crown with regard to witchcraft, which meant death, then abolished them in 1750. Witchcraft, seances, love potions, powwow doctors, none of those traditions ever really left the Keystone State. So many of these customs were brought across the Atlantic Ocean from German and Swedish immigrants who settled in Pennsylvania, as well as immigrants from all over other parts of Europe. Many of these customs lasted for generations, whether it's the hex signs you see in Pennsylvania Dutch country or the legend of La Fiertura, an Italian witch in Philadelphia in the 1940s. People looking for good health, love, or even good fortune sought her out, hoping for an elixir or a potion that would bring them what they so desperately desired. But that's a Pennsylvania witchcraft story for another day. I'd like to thank Diane for giving me the opportunity to join all of you in the Spooktacular crew today and share with you the story of what many believe is the very first documented case of a trial for witchcraft in this country. Thanks, Dina. You're the best. Other European countries moved to end their witch trials in the mid-1700s. Austria would do so in 1755 and Hungary in 1768. There were witch hunts in South America, too. In 1754, a woman named Ursulina de Jesus was burned at the stake in Brazil after being accused by her husband of using witchcraft to make him sterile. He was having an affair with another woman at the time, but Ursulina was found guilty of heresy. Don't you just love that? In 1798, another Brazilian woman was accused of witchcraft. Her name was Maria Dada Senciocao, and it was said she used witchcraft to make potions to bewitch men to attract them. She was found guilty and put to death. 
In 1804, the only witch trial in the state of Ohio takes place. This is shared by Jessica Walters, host of the Shoes, Booze, and Tattoos podcast. And if you haven't binge listened to that one yet, you really ought to. It's excellent. Hi, everyone. And hi, Diane. Thank you so much for having me on. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Jess, and I host the podcast Shoes, Booze, and Tattoos. That's booze spelled B-O-O-S. I like to cover a little bit of everything out of the ordinary, from hauntings and folklore to true crime and history. I'm also a practicing witch, so I do have a few episodes specifically dedicated to the subject. You can always find Shoes, Booze, and Tattoos everywhere you get podcasts. Diane, thank you so much for bringing this story up. Witchcraft trials have always fascinated me from a psychological and a societal standpoint, and this one is one I had never heard of. The only witchcraft trial in my own home state of Ohio is something that I had no idea even happened. When most of us think of the witchcraft trials, we usually think of Salem, especially here in the U.S. Salem happened in 1692. The one trial in Ohio happened over a hundred years later. To me, that was very shocking. The 19th century was a time for spiritualism and forward thinking. And witchcraft wasn't as feared as it once was and wasn't even defined in the same way as most would have during the time of Salem. But somehow, even during this period of enlightenment, even after people saw the error in their ways from the massacre that was Salem. We still managed to host a trial on the grounds of witchcraft in Bethel, Ohio in 1805. This trial is known as the Hildebrand Evans Witchcraft Trial of 1805. Nancy Evans was an elderly woman who lived at the corner of what is now State Route 125 and 232 in Bethel, Ohio. She lived right next door to her accusers the Hildebrand family. The Hildebrands had two daughters who were teenagers at the time. Their elderly neighbor, Nancy Evans, lived alone, and all she owned was her little cabin, the small plot of land that it sat on, and her pet, a black cat. The girls accused Nancy Evans of being a witch, saying that they would see her talking to her black cat at night in her home when no one else was around. They said that the black cat was actually a familiar and that Nancy and the cat were in service to the devil. I don't know about any of you pet owners out there, but I talk to my dog and my cat. So I don't find that that odd. They must not have had pets. The girls would go into hysterics nightly, claiming to be plagued with horrible visions of distorted and demonic faces, and saying that a black mass was looming above them as they tried to sleep. They said that it was Nancy who was tormenting them. Something unique to this case that I could find no other instance of in any other witchcraft trial or accusation was the way the family tried to catch the witch. They devised some sort of trap using a large bag of Lindsay Woolsey. For those of you like me that didn't know what that was, it's basically just a sturdy fabric woven bag made with linen and wool or cotton and wool. This trap was meant to catch the witch by luring her in by performing some kind of ceremony. The witch would hide in the bag, and this was as one of the family members held it in place. Once the ceremony was finished and the witch was believed to be trapped, the bag was closed and tied shut. Then it was laid on the Hildebrand porch where it was chopped into pieces with an axe. All the pieces were then collected and burned. As you can imagine, this had no effect on Nancy Evans. The girls continued to have their nightly bouts of hysteria. That's when the village justice finally stepped in. They decided to have a trial. The method of testing a witch here is actually my favorite. If this method were used regularly, this would have saved so many lives. It's a very old tradition, and it's weighing a witch against the Bible. It was believed that if someone were a witch, the Bible would weigh more because of its ability to overpower evil. 
So the justice there had a crude scale constructed, and that poor elderly Nancy Evans was put on trial for witchcraft. Nancy did willingly submit to the test. And as you'd expect, when the Bible was placed on the other side of the scale, Nancy didn't budge. She did, in fact, weigh more than the Bible. She was found not guilty of the practice of witchcraft and consorting with the devil. After the trial, Nancy Evans ultimately moved out of town and moved to Brown County. She later passed away, and it was said that she was respected and loved by all who knew her. The Hildebrand family also moved out of Bethel. Though we're not sure where, they seem to have kept a low profile after the move. I'm going to assume that it's out of embarrassment, but that's just my opinion. And that is the story of the one and only witchcraft trial in Ohio. Thank you so much again, Diane, for having me on. I can't wait to talk to you again soon and see you in West Virginia. Bye! Thanks, Jess. You rock. Albert R. Hogue writes of two Tennessee cases in history of Fentress County, Tennessee, compiled by the Fentress County Historical Society. Joseph Stout was a man who lived in Fentress County, Tennessee in 1835. He was strange, according to his neighbors. He kept to himself and read what they thought were weird books. So when a young girl from the Taylor family came down with a severe and sudden illness that the doctors couldn't figure out, they blamed Stout. Surely he had bewitched her. The story started circulating about him and included him doing such feats as entering homes through keyholes and casting spells on people who were far away. He was arrested and bound over by a judge, but he was not found guilty. In the same county, in the city of Jamestown, a woman was accused of witchcraft in 1843. Her name was Marcia Millsaps, and the accusation about her from a man named William Bledsoe was as follows. To whom it may concern, a witch of most extraordinary powers made her appearance in Jamestown. She can, at a single touch, convert those who have lived without stain or blemish into the most consummate rogues and rascals. She can transform members of the church into liars, sorcerers, and robbers of hen roosts. She can change her neighbor's geese into her own with a single touch of her all-powerful wand. She infests those who share her bed with an overstock of the loathsome vermin. She fills those with whom she converses with false ideas of her neighbor's honesty. Unless she ceases the exercise of the diabolical art, she shall feel the force of public opinion turned against her. Bledsoe was found liable while Millsaps was found not guilty, and later when she sued, a jury would award her $10,000. So good, she got hers in the end. But there you see just how easy it was for somebody to report on their neighbor, and had it been maybe a different time period or a different state than Tennessee, she might have been put to death for nothing. So by this time... The witch hunts and trials have come to an end. And while today there's still a lot of people when you say you're a witch or they hear about witchcraft, they get these negative images. I think a lot of that negative connotation is starting to roll back. I think people are feeling more comfortable with telling people that they practice something differently. And as I've come to find, there's actually this thing called a Christian witch out there too. And I've been exploring a little bit of that. Very interesting stuff. But now, we like to talk about ghosts on this podcast, so we need to talk about ghosts and witch hunts, and they seem to go hand in hand for a couple of reasons. The obvious explanation is that people were wrongfully accused and put to death. The lesser known reason of why we have these two together is that spectral evidence was used to prove someone was a witch. When someone seemed bewitched in the presence of an accused witch, it was thought that his or her specter was causing the issue. So almost like that person was entering them or using their spirit to go after the person. Emerson Baker is a professor of history at Salem State University, and he wrote the book, A Storm of Witchcraft, The Salem Trials, and the American Experience in 2014. In the book, he writes, While nobody was tried entirely on spectral evidence, it was what was initially brought against almost everyone at Salem, becoming a litmus test for discovering a witch. Spectral evidence was not just drawn from written depositions made before the trial by the afflicted. It was also used in the courtroom with high drama and to great effect. The climax of most trials occurred when the afflicted confronted and accused witches. When this happened, invariably the alleged specter harmed the afflicted, who writhed and shrieked in pain in response to spectral attacks invisible to the jury and the rest of the court. This very public demonstration of spectral evidence could not help but have a strong impact on the jury, giving such evidence far more weight than it deserved. Not only did the judges allow this, but they ignored the many suggestions that such afflictions were being 
faked. Professor Baker here is talking about the Salem witch trials. And when I did that episode on it, we talk about the hauntings that are connected to that. We've also talked about the witch house in Salem and talked about the hauntings that are happening there. Since there was a judge who'd lived there that was connected to the trials, that's why there might be some hauntings going on with that. So not going to rehash that stuff here either. And let me tell you, it was very hard to find stories to go with this, but I did find a few things. I found this interesting story. A 17th century cottage believed to belong to one of the women accused of being a Pendle witch was unearthed near Pendle Hill in the village of Barley. Inside the house was a sealed room that held the skeleton of a cat. Supposedly, this was a practice done to protect the cottage from evil spirits. The cat was bricked up alive. So this is a sign that they did believe in some kind of superstitious witchcraft here. And I do half wonder as well, was the cat bricked up because it was thought of as a familiar The cage is the name of a building that was used to house 14 women accused of practicing witchcraft in St. Osith in Essex in 1582. Three of those women were executed. One of them was Ursula Kemp, and she was a local healer. After being accused, she turned on others and pointed the finger. Essex was a hotbed of witch hysteria, and 85 people in total would lose their lives here. That's really saying something, considering that 110 people were executed in England. So out of 110, 85 of them were from Essex. The cage over the years, it has served a number of purposes and today is a two-bedroom home. But with a history of being a medieval jail, it's not surprising to hear rumors of this cottage being haunted. One of the owners named Vanessa Mitchell fled the home in 2004. She claimed that she had been physically attacked by something she couldn't see and the mysterious blood spots would just appear. A malevolent goat-like apparition was the final straw driving her from the home. Ursula Kemp's skeleton was thought to be unearthed in 1921 during some construction. Her bones had been pierced with nails, iron nails as a matter of fact, which is a sign that she was thought to be a witch. This was done to keep the witch's spirit from haunting people. These remains were taken by somebody and put on display until the house that they were in had a mysterious fire that burned it down. So then they ended up in a couple of other places until documentary producer John Warland negotiated to get the bones and he had them reburied in St. Osef. I imagine if Ursula Kemp's spirit was at unrest, she finally found some rest with this. And as I said, Essex had the most executions from witch hunts. Colchester Castle was a place where the accused were held before going to trial. Here they were shackled, starved, abused, and sickness was rampant. Four women died of typhus in 1545. One of the accused that was eventually hanged was Elizabeth Clark, an 80-year-old woman with one leg. The castle has many haunts, and one of the causes is attributed to the women who died of jail fever here. One night, a man was spending the night locked into the castle. He didn't make it through the night. Two hours in, he appeared at the top of the castle, waving his arms erratically and yelling for help. He was taken to the hospital and had to be sedated. People felt he lost his sanity, and he died a few months later. Elizabeth Clark could be one of the ghosts at Colchester Castle, but she's also thought to haunt the shore of Seafield Bay. This is an area known as the Walls. Witchfinder General Matthew Hopkins helped in leading to the execution of 200 people for witchcraft, mostly in Essex. He was the accuser of Elizabeth Clark. Ironically, he was eventually accused of sorcery himself because he'd stolen a book with the names of all the witches in England written in it. It was thought he used witchcraft to obtain it. Legend claims he was dunked and either drowned or was executed because he floated, but the truth is thought to be that he actually died from tuberculosis. His ghost is said to haunt a pond near where he was buried at St. Mary the Virgin Churchyard. He's also thought to haunt the Red Lion. Many claim to have seen his apparition there, and it was here that he first dragged Clark out into the street to accuse her. The list of people who lost their lives after being accused of practicing witchcraft is too numerous to name everyone. There were hundreds, more than likely thousands. Were any of them actually practicing witchcraft? I'm sure a few were, but for the most part, I think we were dealing with jealousy, anger, fear, and hysteria in these cases. And even if these people were practicing witchcraft, that's not a death sentence. That's just a different belief system. Are there hauntings left over from the spiritual residue? That is for you to decide. As I said, that was just kind of a cursory blowover, a generalization of the different witch hunts that have taken place throughout history and especially in this specific time period between the 1500s and uh, here in America, 1800s, 1700s in Europe. Just a really fascinating and indeed sad time. 
if any of you have heard ghost stories that are in connection to witch hunts or witch trials in your area, I'd love to hear them because it's very hard to find them. And so if I could get some from you guys, that would be wonderful. want to encourage you to check out the website at historyghostbump.com. And if you'd like to send me some feedback, you could do that at historyghostbump at gmail.com. As I record this, it's the first day of September, which in my world means autumn has already started. So bring on Halloween. Let the games begin. And in saying that, we have the virtual trick-or-treat on now. What you need to do is join the Spooktacular crew and then contact either myself or Kelly. Send us an email. Put in the subject line, virtual trick-or-treat. And we will have a list of things that you need to include there. That's why you need to be in the Spooktacular crew so you can see what you need to include in your email. And then what we do is we match you up with another member of the Spooktacular crew and you will send them a virtual trick-or-treat and you will get one in return. You need to do this by the last day of September, September 30th. We're not taking anybody after that time. So if you want to be a part of the virtual trick-or-treat, let us know before September 30th. Because on October 1st, we're matching everybody up and sending out notifications. So, Also, I told you guys I was going to plan a cemetery bingo in October. We're going to be doing that on Saturday, October the 5th. This is the day of the live show in West Virginia. So I want you guys to all come see the live show. It's the only one I'm doing. And if you manage to make it out there, we're going to actually do it together. At 1 p.m., I've picked out a cemetery that's there in West Virginia. It has some of the victims from the Silver Bridge collapse that are buried there. Looks like an interesting cemetery to go through and do cemetery bingo. We'll have more information on that up on the Spectacular Crew, and I will also put it on the website under events. I did get a couple of comments on the website. Rachel wrote, Hi, Diane. I just found out about you guys last Sunday, so I'm working my way through. Thanks for your great show. I don't think you've done either of these yet, so would you consider doing a show on Haunted South Bend, Indiana or Haunted Gary, Indiana? So I've added those to the list, and obviously Gary, Indiana makes me think of Zach Baggins' Demon House. And Susan Putnam wrote, I've been binge listening for a while and love the show. I'm on episode 223 and heard that Diane was wanting to find stories of nude ghosts. One kept coming to mind from Paranormal Witness. This was a heartwarming story of a mother's love that goes beyond death. Christine Scudish, 24, was traveling with her son along Highway 50. Her son Nick was three at the time. They ran off the road and down a steep embankment. Christine died in the crash and Nick was in the car with his mom, not understanding what happened to her. On June 10, 1994, Deborah Hoyt had an urgent feeling to travel this highway, and Deborah and her husband went down this road. As they traveled, Deborah saw a nude woman lying on the side of the road. She asked her husband to turn around and go back, thinking the woman was injured. She could not find the woman, but they were able to find the car crash that could not be seen from the road. This saved the son's life. This happened in Southern California. She said, I'm not sure of the actual events of the story, but it's a sweet story of how a mom saved her son. I don't know if I've talked about it on this podcast before, but I've definitely heard that. And I think he was trapped in the car for almost six days. So, I mean, he was on the verge of dying had he not been found. And I just thought that was so great because obviously, I don't know, I guess in death you can take your clothes off because she knew if she was naked on the side of the road, she'd get some attention. Well, I think that's it for me. I want to thank you guys for listening to this episode. Special thanks to Dina Marie of the Twisted Philly podcast and Jessica Walters of the Shoes, Booze, and Tattoos podcast for joining me on this episode. I've been your host, Diane. You take care now. Bye-bye. This episode was brought to you by Ghost Town Podcast, Pessimist Archive, HelloFresh, and our executive producers. Dispatches from the Grave Digger. We'd like to welcome into the graveyard, Joseph Smith. You're going to be buried in a chest tomb. You can find History Goes Bump on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, Pandora, Google Play, and anywhere you can listen to podcasts.